Welcome back, everyone, to the Great American Recap. It's been a while since we've been together, but as I am a Jedi, I had to go and defeat Darth Maul and take his dual-sided lightsaber here. As I saw the trailer for the uh, new Star Wars coming out of Monday Night Football last night, it was quite, quite a sight. I'm really excited. Speaking of Jedi, we're going to talk about a couple of Jedi and a couple Sith and a couple Jar Jar Binkses today when it comes to the Civil War. First up is an American Jedi, Mr. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee, as secession begins to happen, is on duty down in Texas. And he's actually roughed up on his way home because he's still in his United States Army outfit. He comes home to resign his commission and take care of his house and his ailing wife. When he's home, he is summoned down to the Blair house to um, Francis Blair, one of the Montgomery Blair, excuse me, one of the, the leading advisors of the Lincoln White House, and he is offered sole command of the Union Army to command all Union forces to put down the rebellion. In a lot of people's minds, if Lee accepts this job, the Civil War is over in 1861. His family is steeped in the history of the country. His dad, Light Horse Harry Lee, was the head cavalryman for the great General George Washington. His uncle, Richard Henry Lee, proposed independence in Philadelphia. He married a Washington. Arlington House was built as kind of a museum to the great George Washington by his father-in-law. So this is not something he takes lightly. And as Lee goes back up to Arlington House, he reflects as he sees the lights going out over Washington till one is left on. He says he felt like the apostles in the Garden of Gethsemane keeping watch. But as the last light goes out, he knew what his decision was, and he writes a tearful letter saying he cannot accept because the army would have to march through Virginia. It would be an invasion, and he saw Virginia as his home. My country, my family, and my home. So he turns down the top job. Lee will wind up when Virginia secedes being the head of the Virginia National Guard to prepare for its defense. A huge demotion from head of the Union Army to pretty much a desk job with the Confederacy. Next up, we have two guys who are very interesting. Over here, we have General Irvin McDowell, a very gruff, nasty character who is said to have won only one battle in his life with life with a a watermelon, which is, he used to eat one entire watermelon for a dessert per night. He will be facing off with this guy. These are the two Jar Jar Binkses. PGT Beauregard, who will head the Confederate forces. And these two are going to square off in Manassas, Virginia, at the first Battle of Manassas or Bull Run. General McDowell, suffering from political pressure, in July of 1861, takes the poorly trained Union Army out of Washington, headed straight for Richmond. The men have only signed 90-day enlistments. Many of them up are, are up in August. A lot of guys want to be home for the fall harvesting. So with great political pressure, McDowell leads his army out of Washington. Now, he micromanages everything because he has never been responsible for the strategy, the troop movements, the number of soldiers, supplies, food, ammunition, clothing. It overwhelms him. Following along his army are a bunch of newspaper reporters and senators who have packed their wagons and carriages full of champagne and printed out victory tickets to be held at a victory ball in the governor's mansion in Richmond, Virginia. And as the poorly trained army leaves Washington, they get lost for a couple days. It takes them three or four days to go 20 miles to ground that PGT Beauregard had specifically picked. His army is also poorly trained, but his men can shoot. So he picks a hill above a sloping flat kill zone 
Uh, right in front of a geographical barrier, Bull Run Creek, which is not real wide but very deep, where there's only a tiny little um, bridge over it. And on July 21st, Sunday, July 21st, 1861, the first battle of the Civil War commences. The first cannonball blows up the summer kitchen of Manassas resident Wilmer McLean. And throughout the day, contrary to popular mythology, the Union Army is winning. Um, Irvin McDowell threw a fake left jab and came around with a big right over behind PGT Beauregard's forces. And he's winning, he's crushing them, his men can go forward. They really can't do anything else. In the middle of the battle, arriving via train is new Jedi Thomas Stonewall Jackson, whose troopers are surveying the field. And General B from Alabama gives him the nickname, it was probably an insult, there sits Jackson like a damn stone wall, but we're down here fighting. Let us determine to die here and we will conquer. Meaning, if we fight for our lives, we might win this thing. Shortly thereafter, General B is killed, but Thomas Jackson waits. McDowell's army is smashing into PGT Beauregards. The other troops are coming across the bridge, and they get in front of Thomas Jackson, who tells his men to yell like flirt furies and hit the Union army in the flank. His surprise shocks the Union soldiers. They could go forward, but they could not turn and face an enemy coming to their flank, and they could not retreat. And when they get pushed back, they lose unit cohesion, and as they get to cover on bridge, the senators and congressmen having a picnic on a hill in the middle of the battlefield begin to panic. They run. A massive traffic jam ensues. Cub Run Bridge collapses and it's an every man for himself retreat. For 85% of the day, the Union was winning, but when it counted, the Confederates had a come from behind victory, an upset win, and the Union Army retreat is hundreds of yards wide and miles deep. Every run, one runs back to Washington, and President Lincoln can't believe it. My God, I've just lost the opening battle. Another one of his sons gets sick and dies of the fever, and Mary Todd was completely beside herself. Lincoln is in the White House all alone. He has no time to mourn because he's got to focus on the battle. He has to relieve Wilmer McLean of command. And this will bring in con another Confederate Jedi. Thomas Jackson gets the nickname Stonewall. His fury and his passion, a man full of idiosyncrasies who held his hand aloft and ate lemons and stunk his, st stuck his head in cold water every morning, now strikes fear into the hearts of Union soldiers. So the Union turns to this guy, the smug, arrogant, brilliant but vain George McClellan, an engineer who will be brought to the Union. And he gets there and he looks at the Army and using his engineer's mind, he quickly, you know, puts them through the paces. He divides up the army. Some men are marching. Some men are on the rifle range. Some men are learning artillery. Some men are policing the camp. And he is the one who, through the daily paces, trains and outfits the Union Army. But he's vain, and he's egocentric, and he is at odds with President Lincoln throughout. It takes him nearly eight months to use the army that was built for him, or that, that he builds. And they'll fight in the famous Seven Days or Peninsula campaign. But for better or for worse, George McClellan is the guy who trains the Union Army. While he's doing that, we have our last Jedi for the Union, Ulysses Grant, who will capture two twin forts on the Tennessee River, Forts Donaldson and Henry in Tennessee. They weren't smashing brilliant victories. They were just brutal and straightforward. And in capturing the second fort, Ulysses Grant rides up to his, an old friend of his, a guy named Simon Bolivar Buckner. And Buckner asks Grant, what are the terms of surrender? And Grant says, unconditional and immediate surrender. And his friend Buckner, who at one time loaned him money, 
to get home from California when he quit the army. He said, those are the most ungenerous and unchivalrous terms among friends I have ever heard. And Grant replies, honor among friends is one thing, but war is another. And Simon, this is war. So Grant arrests one of his good buddies. Watching this are newspaper reporters who eat this up. And U.S. Grant stands for Unconditional Surrender Grant, and the Union has their first hero. Because he is made famous by the newspapers, he has tried to be sacked. People call him a drunk. They say he performed horribly. But a young newspaper reporter from Chicago, Elihu Washburn, has an audience with Lincoln and says, I was there, I never saw this guy drunk. As a matter of fact, he's the only one who knew what he is doing. And Grant was reinstated, headed for next week's wrap up, the battles of Shiloh and the Seven Days Campaign. So I hope you enjoyed it. Today was a story of Sith, of Jedi, and Jar Jar Binks. So with that, we'll see you guys next week.